So thanks for being here. Um, I know this isn't terribly interactive. I wish this was in person so we could all uh, be talking together, but um, I, I someday will do this class again in person. It's gonna be great. But I appreciate y'all for being here and for um, uh, taking some time out of your day to learn and to grow. And hopefully at the end of this, we're all uh, better agents and better people and uh, better able to serve our clients. So. Um, my name is Dave Umfress. In a second here, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown. I know a lot of you, some of you I haven't met, but um, if you're anything like me, anytime you come to a class, you're thinking, who is this person? Should I listen to them? Are they trustworthy? So I'll run a, few, a couple of things in a few minutes that hopefully establish um, me as a little bit of a position of being willing to help. But um, still, I'd say, uh, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, lost arts in this um, culture today is the ability to chew the meat and spit out the bones, actually find good stuff you like and things and then spit out the rest. So hopefully everybody comes away with a couple of pieces of meat that they can apply and then the rest that they can uh, spit out and move on. But um, I'm gonna go back and forth between uh, some screen share stuff and some uh, uh, stuff with me. So if I ever forget to switch back, let me know or uh, type in the chat or something and somebody can remind me that, uh, that we're not actually sharing. But um, Let's start by doing a quick rundown of what we're going to be going through today, just so everybody has a good, decent idea of where we are, and then um, we'll jump back over here. So da, 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 da. let's share. So I've got a couple of goals today. Um, like I said, the first thing I'm going to talk just briefly about is uh, who am I and why should you listen to me, hopefully. Um, I want to go through five non-negotiable rules of negotiation. This is stuff that uh, um, I think are super helpful in all of life, not just in real estate negotiation, but uh, then we're going to go through the five key skills for negotiation that should be applied, could be applied to every day, including real estate. Um, next, we're going to go through the five everyday real estate applications. So five scenarios that this applies to a lot that you could all probably start to, to uh, implement right away. And then last, we're going to talk about questions, next steps. If you want to continue the conversation, there's a couple other opportunities after that for, uh, um, for people to continue. So um, that's where we're going to go. But let's start by... Screen big up. Um, just really briefly, I geek out on negotiation. I, for a little while, this has been a topic that I get really excited about and interested in. And um, if anybody on my team or in my office knows that I've been on a significant rabbit hole in the last several months. And so one of the ways to further yourself down a rabbit hole even more is to teach on something. And so I decided a couple months ago that I wanted to continue to take in all the content I could to create a simple short, succinct class on real estate negotiation that I think could be helpful for uh, uh, the agents on my team, the agents in the office, and anybody else in town that's willing to talk about negotiation. So um, that's where we are. I, I've been a negotiator my whole life. I love negotiation. I think it's probably uh, too fun. And I think one of the realities that stuck out to me a lot in the last uh, six months or so as I've been digging here is just how broad negotiation is. And so hopefully after this class, everybody walks away with maybe a broader definition and the realization that uh, we're negotiating constantly. Um, studies show that, it, I mean, most people suggest that we're in five to seven negotiations a day. Um, somebody else looked at a real estate transaction and they suggested that we do probably 25 or 26 negotiations from meeting a client to closing. That that's how many times we are theoretically negotiating. And we'll define negotiation in a little bit here, um, just so there's maybe a good working definition for all of us to talk about. But um, I, like I said, I've loved negotiating my whole life. Um, I was a big garage sale freak as a kid. I just, I've always loved them. They're, they're such a waste of time. And I still stop by several garage sales a weekend just for fun. And it's, to me, it's good training ground to learn how to negotiate. But uh, my son is five now, and um, as early as probably two, I can remember at least, anytime he asked for something, he's smiling and nodding his head and saying yes as he's asking, like, like, do you want to go outside and play soccer? Yeah. Like, he's leading me to my answer. Like, even this kid at two is starting to pick up on some negotiating tactics and strategies. But my parents said as a kid, whenever I wanted something, I would never ask for one more of anything. I always asked for two more of whatever it was. And so if I wanted a uh, soccer, I would ask if I could have two. If I wanted to go play a game, I'd ask if we could play two games, whatever it was. And somehow uh, I was probably learning that somewhere in the middle, you'd land on one more of what you want. But, um, but I mean, the fact is the, the, I've had a little bit of time to think about some examples. Probably all of you, if you could think about a couple of examples today, even of when you've been in a negotiation, you'd probably be able to think of uh, several. 
And a good working definition for us right now is just any time we're looking for a yes, anytime we're looking for somebody to agree or to say yes or to go along with what we're suggesting or what we're, uh, um, what we're wanting to happen. So um, let's see, let's pivot to real estate. I did a lot of things before I got into real estate. I uh, primarily worked in the nonprofit space and uh, teaching PE during the days to put food on the table. In 2008, 2009, the uh, living on donor support wasn't exactly the most lucrative life as a lot of people were losing half of their net worth. So um, slinging lattes at Starbucks and stocking shelves at Whole Foods at night, uh, put food on the table too. Um, but there was a nine month period between when I was done teaching, I taught PE and when I got into real estate and in those nine months, it was the most miserable nine months of my life, but I sold cars. I worked at a car dealership for those nine months. And within three months of being at this dealership, a huge, probably one of the biggest car dealerships here in the Denver area, I was selling more cars than every veteran salesman there. And what I learned in just this perfect mix of negotiation tactics and strategies, but also the um, need for trust and empathy and the desire to build a connection with the client, not to sell them something, but so that there was trust, um, just outshined any skill that that industry offered. And it was pretty eye-opening for me. And it was also a great, um, it was a miserable nine months, but it was a great springboard into real estate. So um, today I run several companies in the real estate space, uh, a Keller Williams office down here on the south side of town, um, a, a sales team that most of my time is spent with, some of the most incredible agents, lots of them are on this call right now here in town that I spend the most of my time with. Um, we're about 95 million closed in pended volume right now. So we'll finish the year about 110, 115 or so. And then that's now a, a network of agents called the Flourish Real Estate Network, which is a group of agents that are connected around our nonprofit called Flourish, all rallying around the same, uh, the same causes. So um, there's other agents not in our office that are connected to us um, through, uh, through Flourish. So now as a former teacher who loves making complex things simple, I get to do things like this all the time of just simplifying complicated processes or things that I think would be helpful with uh, um, people building businesses. So. Um, as far as negotiation goes and why I think over the next 90 minutes, this um, should be uh, hopefully helpful. There, there's a lot of things in the last probably six months or so that I've dug into. Some of these were a couple of years ago, but um, just for the sake of putting together something I think should be helpful. So um, lots of you have probably taken the real estate negotiation expert training through NAR, which was pretty decent. Uh, lots of content from Chris Boss, the author of Never Split the Difference, Hostage Negotiator. Um, the Harvard Business School's negotiation certification that I'm in the middle of that's arguably the best negotiation training in the country. And then lots of my own experiences in this industry, seeing hundreds of transactions a year or thousands if you count the brokerage. So the, all of that summarizes into what we're going to talk about. So the sole purpose of this is to help all of us hopefully become better at negotiating. And uh, I hope that when I run into a year from now, you say, I used something from that class. Actually, we were talking about this in my team a couple of weeks ago. And one of the agents had a listing appointment that night and she used one of the tactics that we had talked about in that team meeting and she took the listing and she thinks that it had something to do with the tactic she used. So hopefully that's true. And hopefully all of you can say a similar, uh, um, similar thing from today. Um, before we start though, today is Corey Holtman's birthday. Corey Holtman is an agent in the Arvada Keller Williams office that's connected to us through the Flourish Network. And if you see Corey in the chat thing, go find her and private message her and tell her happy birthday. Or find her on Facebook and tell her. So happy birthday, Corey. Um, all right, we're going to start with, I'm going to switch back to screen sharing now so you don't have to look at me and you can look at what I'm looking at. So, dun, 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 dun. all right, we should be good now. So we're going to start by talking about some myths of negotiation. So real quick, there's a couple of things that I think come stand out to people typically when they start thinking about negotiation. And um, the first one, I... I've alluded to this a couple of times with some conversations with some of you, but the first one is that negotiation is a zero sum game, that there's winners and losers, that for one person to win, it means somebody else lost, and that there really isn't a way for a negotiation to truly benefit both sides. And I definitely think that that is not true. Um, so much of negotiation is helping somebody accomplish what they want to accomplish anyways, and we're just helping them get there through the process that we are suggesting, or the process that we are proctoring. And so an example might be a seller that wants to price their property a certain price and you want to price it at a different price. You've gotten clear with them about their desired outcome. Their goal is to net the most money in the least amount of time with the least hassle or whatever their goal might be. And let's say they needed to be out of here in two months at the highest price. 
and they want to list it at 650 and you want to list it at 600 and you know that based on where the market is and what's happening around you, where the direction of the market, the seasonality, et cetera, that 600 would be their best bet. Well, by you negotiating the right price with them and getting them to list at the price that you think is most advantageous for them, yeah, they might not get to list at 650, but ultimately they're going to accomplish their goal by getting that property listed at the right price that's going to cause it to sell at the highest possible price. And so um, in a lot of instances, negotiation really, it might seem like a zero sum game in that at the end there is a decision made, but oftentimes uh, you're helping them accomplish their goal still. Um, a myth negotiation is expressive and talking, not, not responsive, listening, observing, et cetera. I'd say a lot of negotiation is very nonverbal. It's done in actions and preparations and silence and ignoring calls. Um, lots of you've probably worked with me on deals where I'm on the listing side and you're on the buying side and I might ignore your call or your email at times and I apologize. Lots of times there is a purpose behind that. Um, not always. Sometimes it's just bad, bad agent. Um, let's see, I'd suggest that maybe 75% of negotiation is listening. It's nonverbal. It's, it's, um, looking for the opportunity. It's looking for, uh, the gold and something that the other person is saying, maybe 15% is talking and 10% is nonverbal actions. Um, that's just a guess though. Uh, let's say next myth, all negotiation is confrontational. Lots of people think negotiation has to be like this fight, like, uh, two people negotiate, and there's probably lots of movies that taught us a lot of things that we think about negotiation, but it definitely doesn't have to be. I mean, sometimes negotiation is a very friendly, conversational thing. The other side doesn't even realize that you're negotiating with them. Um, when you meet a buyer, for instance, when you're sitting across the table from a potential buyer, talking to them about the process, about how you can help, and coaching them through the process, setting expectations, um, they're in a negotiation with you for their home buying process. And when you're showing them your value and when you're helping them see how they can win, and I mean, them trusting you with this process is essentially you winning this negotiation. But lots of times they don't quite recognize what you're going. I mean, you're, you're setting expectations, you're guiding how the process is going to go two, three months from now in that conversation. But um, some people, a good definition for confrontation is a focused comparison. I mean, sometimes if we're focusing on a comparison between two options, maybe one is, um, I don't have a good example off the top of my head with the buyer consultation. Maybe they are looking in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood, or they're talking about putting $0 down so that they can spend the money on a renovation, a renovation afterwards. And you're talking to them about the option of a 203k mortgage or purchasing and then doing a, a HELOC on the back end for the reno or whatever. You're focused comparison on two different options and you're guiding them through that. It is a negotiation, even if it doesn't seem like it. But um, last one. The myth is that negotiation is an obvious event and that it only occasionally occurs. So you would say, if I asked most of you, how many negotiations have you been in today? You'd say, I don't know, none, one maybe, maybe two. And I think the myth is that it just doesn't happen very often. And the most dangerous negotiation that you're in is the ones you don't realize you're in. And that's quite a bit. So we talked about five to seven a day on average. I would suggest if you have kids, you could probably double that. I mean, we're pretty much constantly negotiating something with kids about uh, things that we are looking for agreement on. You know, I mean, if I want my kid to, my five-year-old to wear a coat to school today, real, real life example, I mean, I am wanting him ultimately to conclude that, yeah, I should wear a coat today. You know, if I make him wear a coat, that thing's coming off the second he gets out of the car, right? So anyways. Um, not bitter or anything. So why do we talk about negotiation? You know, I talked about how we are pretty much constantly, uh, uh, constantly in it. Most, uh, I don't remember what I was reading, some study or something where somebody counted the amount of times in a transaction that they would say that there was negotiation happening in a real estate transaction. And they said 25 or 26 times from start to finish when we first meet that client. So just to, uh, for a little bit of foundation, I just jotted down a couple of times that I would suggest that we're in a negotiation, you know, it's easy for us to think that like with a seller or with a, we're on the buy side, we're negotiating with the listing agent, right? Like that's the time that we're negotiating, but we, we miss so many other, um, so many other times, Ex expectation setting with those buyers so that they know um, what they're going to run into and that we have a high chance of, uh, of success. You know, the better we do of setting those expectations up front in that conversation, the better we're going to do when they find their dream house and they're writing an offer against 15 other offers and we actually want theirs to be accepted. We are negotiating with them at that point to get them to write an offer that's going to cause them to succeed, of course. Um, but how we do in the upfront expectation setting really changes a lot of it. Um, securing that agency agreement, convincing the buyer that we are the ones for them that they want to sign with and getting them to sign that. 
um, getting them to write competitive offers that aren't offensive, that aren't wasting their time, the seller's time, that aren't discouraging them in their, uh, uh, in their search, um, which in this market often means getting them comfortable with some of the realities of strong offers, inspection, appraisal, loan, stuff like that. Uh, getting buyers to deliver earnest money and schedule inspections. Anybody ever had that where they get a, a buyer goes under contract and then it's the actual process of delivering earnest money that um, can be painful. <laughs> Maybe that's where the reality sets in. Um, overcoming an inspection report with 185 items on it that the inspector gives you a 130 page report um, can definitely be a negotiation. Appraisal, appraisal hurdles to jump. Um, Walkthrough issues. I had one a couple of days ago that they were upset because there were three paint cans left in the garage. Um, and so we're negotiating through some of these issues about, well, what happens if uh, things are not going exactly how expected. Um, da, 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 or there's the drapes aren't there that are supposed to be. There's trash in the trash cans. I had that one recently. Uh, things like that. I mean, we're constantly negotiating even up through closing, referrals after closing, negotiating with that client to send referrals. With a seller, we're setting the appointment. I mean, we could do a million with a seller, but guiding them on the appointment as to um, which way to go with, um, signing with you, securing the listing agreement, pricing the home, staging the home, preparation for showings, when to allow showings. I mean, with a seller, it's just a constant negotiation. And then with a co-op, the easiest ones, putting a home under contract, price, terms, dates, uh, working through inspection things, working through appraisal, et cetera. So anyways, that is just a brief list of some of the times that we are applying this. But um, so let's jump in now. We're gonna go through, first are my five non-negotiable rules for negotiation. Um, the lots of these are, I mean, everything that we're going to talk about, almost everything is either stolen from somebody that I respect that I already mentioned, or from my experiences. So anything that you hear, just assume that it's somebody else, not me. Very few of these things are original. So um, these, uh, these rules are, are things that I put together, but I think they're uh, good guides. So number one, let's see if we can advance the slide here. Five non-negotiable rules of negotiation. Rule number one is whoever goes second wins, which the easier way of saying this is whoever goes first loses, but that doesn't fit with my, uh, with my next four. So um, whoever goes second wins. I, was, I mean, just picture with me, if you will, you're at a garage sale. I mentioned I like garage sales. And oftentimes at a garage sale, if you look around for a minute, the seller will say, is there anything in particular you're looking for, right? I mean, you don't see it here on the driveway. I've got another 85% of my crap inside. Maybe I have the thing you're looking for. And let's just say you're looking for a lawnmower. And so you say, yeah, I was actually looking for a lawnmower. I mean, you've shopped for lawnmowers. You have a pretty good idea of how much they cost and what you're going to pay. And these days, because of there's shortages on everything in the world, so it's probably more. And let's say you're, you're going to pay 600 bucks at the store for a lawnmower. So you're thinking, I'd, I'd like to pay a little less, a good bit less at a garage sale. It's a used lawnmower, so uh, I'd, I'd like it. And they say, well, yeah, I've got this lawnmower over here in my garage. I, I guess I'd sell it. I hadn't really thought about it, but I don't need it anymore. I'm moving to the home and here's a lawnmower. So what do you, uh, what do you want to pay for it? And whoever goes first in this conversation is going to lose. And so I, I say, I, I don't know, honestly, I don't even know anything about your lawnmower. I've had a chance to research it. I don't know if it works or not. I haven't used it for the last five years. You have. I don't even know. I mean, I don't even know what I would be willing to pay. What, what do you, what do you think? And in your head, you'd probably pay 200 bucks for this lawnmower because you know that they're more expensive than they used to be. Even though when this was new, because of inflation, this guy probably paid 300 bucks for it. But you're thinking, I'd probably give him $200. And he says, I don't know, I maybe 50 bucks. And you say, great, sold, 50 bucks, here it is. If you would have given your number first, I guarantee you would have paid more. You probably would have said 200 bucks and you would have paid 200 bucks. In any simple negotiation like this, whoever puts the number fourth first almost always loses. Another quick recent example, I had an inspection, it just closed a few weeks ago, so it probably went under contract two months ago. And things were still pretty busy, but this only had one offer on this deal, this house. So it wasn't like we had all this backup power. And we got the inspection report back and they had asked for 15 things to be, uh, to be fixed. And this isn't an old place. It was built in the mid 2000s and most of the things they asked for were really ridiculous. Um, and so I went to the seller, seller's an investor, doesn't want to mess with this, doesn't want to fix anything. And I said, Hey, what, what do you want to do about this? Some of these things, yeah, you might have to deal with the other buyers, but we should keep this buyer on the hook. And the seller said, honestly, I would probably pay as much as $8,000, maybe even up to 10 just to keep things moving and not deal with this. Um, but just see what you can do. And so of course I go back to them to get the, I apologize profusely if the person that I was working this deal with is on this, that'd be really awkward. 
Um, but we, um, I, so I go back to her and I say, listen, they don't want to mess with this. Most of these are kind of ridiculous. I mean, downspouts are 20 bucks at Home Depot. You can put those on yourself. That one's easy. I mean, that's just a little stuff like this, some bigger stuff. I said, you know, we're, we're willing to do a credit, but we can't really, uh, we can't do a lot of this stuff. What do you, would your buyer be open for a credit? She goes and asks, yes, the buyer's willing to do a credit. And she says, how much would, uh, would your seller be willing to do? And I said, honestly, I don't even know. I mean, lots of the stuff is kind of small that he could do on the, the buyer could do on their own. I don't really know what we should go for. She said, well, just give me a number. I said, I don't know. We went back and forth. And eventually she goes and talks to the buyer, comes back with her number. Okay. Seller's willing to pay $8,000, possibly up to 10,000, just to keep things moving forward. And this, the listing agent or the buyer's agent says, the buyer would be comfortable moving forward at $1,500. And of course, without too quickly reacting, we say, okay, we can, we can make that work. $1,500 concession, go. If we would have given any number, it wouldn't have even mattered what our number was in that case. If we're willing to pay eight, maybe as much as 10, our low ball number might've been $5,000 or $4,000. And in situations, in some simple negotiations like this, it's so important to allow the other person to give some sort of number first. That's rule number one. Um, we, won't, uh, we won't go a whole lot deeper on that one right now. Rule number two, uh, I think I have, da, 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 da. Sorry, I got too much stuff going on here. Rule number two is whoever has, come on. Rule number one was whoever goes second wins. Rule number two is whoever has the most information wins. This one's pretty self-explanatory, but um, walking into, in this industry, this is broad, but walking into any appointment we go into, whether it's a buyer appointment where we're, information looks like information on the market, on neighborhoods they're interested in, on um, average days on market, average list of sold price, things like that. Uh, information going into a listing appointment, into a contract negotiation, into an inspection negotiation, et cetera. Every piece of information that we can grab ahead of time is is incredibly important this market in the last couple of years unfortunately has really spoiled a lot of agents to the point where they don't really have to or they don't choose to um bring the the amount of information they really need i mean in this market i was talking to a coach the other day who made some comment about how comps are worthless in this market like you don't need comps anymore in this market and i'm like how stupid is that that that's how lazy we've gotten we go into a listing appointment and we say yeah what what really matters i mean Maybe it sells here, maybe it sells there. Who really knows? Let's list it here and just kind of see what happens. And we're starting to see, what do they say? When the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing shorts or something like that. I mean, we're, we're going to start to see who, uh, uh, who could really use this advice here. We had over 900 price reductions each week right now. I mean, so obviously pricing conversations are becoming more important than they used to. But this information going in, who usually knows the most about that house when you go into a listing appointment? The houses in the neighborhood, it's typically the seller. And so in these conversations, I need to go into this meeting very prepared. In a negotiation with a buyer's agent, um, when there's three comps that sold recently in that neighborhood that we're going to talk through as we're coming up with a price, um, I better know everything about those houses. I better know when they sold, why they sold. Of course, the seller's going to know the story behind it. Like, well, they were getting a divorce, and so they had to sell quickly, and that meant here. That doesn't matter a whole lot. I need to come in with the information on, on uh, the actual um, facts about the information with the co-op agent is the same with the um, inspection negotiation. You know, when I go back to that agent to, to talk about where we're at with inspection, I mean, I need to go with the information on comparable bids on things that we're seeing in the market, et cetera. So whoever has the most information wins, number two. Number three, rule number three, whoever, hang on, whoever has the most patience wins. Um, the, there's a story that of, uh, the North Vietnamese army uh, negotiating with the, uh, with the United States at the end of the, the Vietnam War. And they were meeting in somewhere in Europe, I forgot where, and um, Denmark maybe, I don't know. And they, they were meeting to, go, to negotiate the end of this war. And the United States showed up, they rented a couple of hotel rooms, they were prepared for a quick open and shut negotiation. And the North Vietnamese crew came to town. They bought three condominiums and they dug their heels in for the long haul. And it ended up being a long negotiation and they were very prepared to be patient. And it was the example that they were showing by purchasing as opposed to renting a couple of hotel rooms that they're not going anywhere, that they are here for, uh, for the long haul. Um, it, if you, hopefully nobody has had to deal with this recently, but let's pretend you get in a car accident today, God forbid, not hurt. And you have to go buy a car tomorrow. 
And you know, things are tight right now at car dealerships. There's almost nothing on the lots. I don't know if you've seen um, a car dealership recently. They're, they have no cars. And you have a listing appointment tonight. You have to get a car right now. Like if you don't get a car today, you're going to miss this listing. And your buyers are coming to town this weekend. You've got to get a car right now. Who's going to win that negotiation? I mean, you don't have a whole lot of patience going into this conversation with this car dealership. And that's what a lot of people are feeling right now in the auto industry. But the lack of patience in any negotiation is going to cause you to have very little, uh, very little power. But um, oftentimes it comes down to education. I mean, helping our clients understand the cyclical nature of the industry or helping them know that their options, what their options are going in, um, giving them the tools, resources, ability to help them create a hedge of patience around them. So um, like a buy before you sell program that gives them patience or understanding the ups and downs of the markets that where if they have the ability to buy in December and list their current house in March or whatever, some of it's just education around creating that, that patience. But that's rule number three. Rule number four is, let's see if we can get there. Whoever has the most options wins. Um, if you only have two options and they're both bad options, then you're going to end up with a bad option. I mean, it's just, um, that's just the reality. And as a buyer's agent, my job is to shake the bushes and come up with as many off market opportunities as I can. Uh, last year, over 20% of our transaction on the team were off market this year. It's probably going to be closer to 25%. I mean, that's my job is to create opportunities for my buyers to create um, wins for my sellers. I mean, a lot of the time creating options, giving options to clients um, helps them win, causes all of us to win. So that's rule number four, whoever's the most options wins. And rule number five, and last but not least, whoever asks the most questions, the best questions wins, not the most questions, that would get annoying. Um, so a couple of thoughts on questions. I mean, the value that we'll talk about in a little bit is just removing the word why from our vocabulary the best we can. In any, uh, in any negotiation, replacing it with how or what. Uh, as a kid, you probably broke something or knocked something down. And the first question you hear is, why did you do that? Or why are you over here? Why are you touching that? Why are you whatever? And we learn early on that when we're asked why, it's, it's kind of confrontational. Um, and um, oftentimes in these negotiations, um, if I can ask a how or a what question, I can get to my, uh, get to my goal a little better. But um, I love starting questions I love starting conversations with sellers with creative questions that lots of times are scripted ahead of time, but um, let's pretend is one of my favorite ways to start a question. So if I was sitting down with a seller, um, lots of people on my team are sick of hearing this question because I think it's a great question to ask in most contexts, but let's pretend I had a magic wand and let's pretend that I have this magic wand that I can wave and the most incredible, perfect scenario for you is what happens. I mean, tell me about that scenario or let's pretend you woke up this morning and a miracle happened overnight, like just some insane miracle happened overnight. How would you know? And let somebody talk about that. I mean, but questions that start with let's pretend to me are a great, uh, great way to get people talking. But um, so um, some of the skills that we're going to learn though, like are around asking questions that are going to cause people to feel understood or cared for or leading them to trust you. I mean, that's the key. That's our goal is to obtain trust in any negotiation that is the goal. And we got to keep in mind too, that not all of these negotiation things that we're going to talk about our skills are one-time things. I mean, lots of you, I haven't, I can't see who's in this right now, who's in this call, but lots of you have done, we've done deals together. We'll probably continue to deal, do deals together. We have to keep in mind that negotiation oftentimes is an ongoing thing. And it's not something that you want to burn some bridge to win some deal. I mean, lots of times the, the experience, when somebody feels understood and heard and like you cared about their desired outcome. And in the end, we get to a place that maybe isn't their preferred, 100% preferred place, but they felt understood. They felt heard. They're going to want to work with you again. And so we got to keep in mind that, uh, um, uh, that that's where we're at. So the last thing on the questions, and then we'll move on, but never underestimate someone's desire to correct you. People love correcting you. And sometimes if you want to ask a question and there's not a great way to ask it, Sometimes you can just give somebody the opportunity to correct you and you will be asking them a question. So you're in a listing appointment and they're talking about the neighborhood expert is going to list their house. And you might want to say, well, what are they going to list it for? How much are they, they going to list it for, you know, 1% or are they listing it for free or whatever? Um, sometimes just making a statement and giving them the ability to correct that will be enough to ask your question. So I'm sure that agent offered you to list the house for 1% or I'm assuming they told you they could get you around $650,000 for the house. 
whatever you're calling, whatever you're proclaiming about that agent or what they told them, they would love to jump in and correct you. So actually it's 2% or if they're listening for two and a half percent or apples or whatever, I know we're not supposed to talk about commissions, but you get the point. Giving somebody the ability to correct you sometimes can be just as powerful as asking a great question. So that is the last piece on, uh, on asking questions. So that's it. That's the top five non-negotiable rules of negotiation. So we're going to jump into five key skills. And these are skills that could apply to real estate negotiation. It could apply to um, really any negotiation in your life. And some of it's going to feel kind of weird. Let's, let's do a quick... Uh, Everybody put a thumb up on one hand. That's something that uh, Chris Boss does, which I think is just brilliant. Put a thumb up on one hand and then put your index finger out on the other hand, okay? Thumb up, index finger. I can only see about seven of you, so I don't know if, who's doing it, who's not, but just believe me. Now switch them. Put a thumb up on the other one and your index finger on switch. Now switch them again. Now switch them again and again and again, 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 again. Keep switching them back and forth as quick as you can. And it's probably starting to feel kind of weird. You probably got two thumbs up on one and two index fingers out on the other. It's just odd. It's just weird. You've probably never done that before. And uh, studies show that it takes about 63 or 64 repetitions of something before a neural pathway is created that makes it feel less awkward, that makes it feel uh, pretty normal. Um, brushing your teeth. Try brushing your teeth with your opposite hand tonight when you go home with your left hand if you're right-handed. And it's going to feel really awkward. You're probably going to move your head back and forth more than you're actually moving the uh, toothbrush back and forth. But if you did that for 63 or 64 times or 32 days or so, if you're brushing it twice a day, it's not going to feel that weird anymore. It's going to start feeling pretty, uh, pretty normal. And I guarantee you that's going to be how a lot of this stuff sounds or feels. Some of the skills we're going to talk about are going to feel awkward until you try it. And then you try it a couple of more times. And so for me, over the last several months, as I've been diving down this rabbit hole, I've been practicing and trying a lot of these skills a little bit more, and they're starting to feel pretty normal. Um, I'll, if we have time, I'll tell you a couple of stories recently of um, some applications. But so first one we're going to talk about is the skill of mirroring. Let me see if I can advance our slide here. So mirroring is essentially... Um, I, turning a wrestling match into a dance is a good way of saying it, but all mirroring really is, is repeating the last two or three words that somebody says in their sentence as a way to draw them out and to get them to talk more. Um, the goal of mirroring is to build a connection and to build trust with the person you're talking to and essentially just to um, be curious about what they're saying. Uh, this is going to sound like probably the simplest thing we talk about here today, and you're going to want your money back, which I'll be sure all of you get instant refunds after this is over. But this is it, it's as simple as that. It's just repeating the last couple of words that they say. So if somebody says, um, I'm just looking at my window here and so I'll just make up an example about Starbucks here and say, I, I just went to Starbucks and I had the best drink I've ever had. If I was mirroring myself, I would say, the best drink you've ever had? And then myself would be like, yeah, it was a pumpkin cold brew. Has anybody had pumpkin cold brews at Starbucks? They're ridiculous. I would say it's a pumpkin cold brew and it might change my life. And then me mirroring myself would say, might change your life? And I'd say, yeah, I don't think I can go back to normal ever. Like, I don't think my life will ever be. Anyways, you get the point. I'm just repeating the last two or three words that I said as a way to draw the conversation out. In a few minutes here, we'll do some examples. But that's the first one. Let's get through a couple, and then we will apply some of these. So the first one was mirroring, repeating the last two to three uh, words of the sentence. Number two is labeling. Um, your limbic system in your brain has an almond-sized organ called the amygdala, which is essentially the command center for your, uh, for your emotions. 75% is dedicated to negative emotions, 25% to um, positive emotions. And there's been lots of studies on the amygdala in the brain. And every study, when an emotion is identified, it decreases that emotion if it's a negative emotion. And so if you're feeling frustrated and you're visibly frustrated, um, and let's pretend your name's Joe, and I tell you something that really upsets you, and I say, Joe, listen, I can tell you're really frustrated. Just by me labeling that emotion, it's going to cause that emotion to decrease. Every study has shown the same thing. Um, and the purpose of labeling is to, if it's a negative emotion, it's to help that person get out of that negative emotion. If it's a positive emotion, like I can see that you're passionate about something or really like to um, help or whatever. I mean, I'm acknowledging that as a way of acknowledging you and saying, I see that, I recognize that, I see you. Um, so labeling can be um, really valuable. We're going to talk about some examples in a little bit here, but um, so asking someone why something makes them defensive, like if I can tell the Joe's upset and I say, why are you upset? Um, 
it's, it's not going to get us anywhere. But if I just tell Joe, like, hey, I understand, I can definitely tell you're upset, or I can tell that this is really uh, uh, rubbed you the wrong way or whatever. Um, yeah, anyways, there's a couple examples that why actually can help us on the positive. Uh, I don't think we'll have a whole lot of time to talk about those, but um, sometimes if we're trying to isolate um, our value proposition, we can use why. Remind me at the end, if we have time, we'll talk about the couple instances that I think why actually could be helpful in, uh, in talking about your proposition. But, um, and anytime we're labeling, it starts with, um, I, uh, it seems like, it sounds like, it feels like, it looks like. It's never me. It's never about me. It's never, I think that you're, or I, it looks to me like, you know, labeling has to be about them. It's never, you know, about me. It's, Joe, it, it looks like you really value your customers and it, that seems to be really rubbing you the wrong way. Or it appears like, or it feels like, or it looks like, or it seems like. So those are the first two we're gonna talk about is mirroring and labeling. And we have not rehearsed this, but I asked somebody to role play with me to practice these two. Is Laura on here? Ingrid, do you see Laura on our call? Hi, Dave. What's up, Laura? How's it going? Good, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for thanks for being our guinea pig. I asked Laura yesterday to role play with me for a few minutes, and I, we talked about no context whatsoever about what she's going to talk about. I just asked her to talk for a couple minutes about uh, something that she's passionate about. And so, Laura, just give me give me the rundown. What is it that you are passionate about? Uh, I am passionate about my kiddo and spending really good quality time with him. Nice, awesome. I love it. Um, so Laura, what is it about, it's Brayden, right? Just for all of us to the, be on the same page. What is it about Brayden and spending time with him that makes you passionate? Oh gosh. Um, what makes me passionate is that when we spend time together, when we learn about each other's interests and things that motivate us, um, being able to provide the support and um, encouragement and um the connectiveness that it creates. Um, it's definitely something that number one brings a lot more happiness into life just to be able to spend it doing something awesome with somebody that you have to spend time with, like my child. Um, however, it also is teaching him different skills about making sure to um, constantly dream, constantly do things that um, are gonna push him and make him excel, um, giving him reasons to be able to improve. Um, those are all definitely things that that are reasons. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like more than your own enjoyment of this, you really care about how Braden turns out and his future and the life that he's building. I definitely do. Yeah. What, what do y'all like to do together? Oh, gosh. Um, we like to travel. Um, we like to set goals and then work together to achieve them. Um, we like to laugh and go on adventures. Just a couple of examples. You said work together to achieve your goals? Yes. Unpack that a little bit. Um, well, I'll just use it as an example. Obviously, I'm, I, I work a lot from home. And being a single parent, there's definitely times where I need to just make sure that I am doing my job here and that I can do it without being distracted. And one of the things that we have put into place is to sit down together and, and put those goals together. Um, where they matter to both of us. Um, if they were just my things that were important to me and I said, hey buddy, I need to do this because I need to accomplish this and he didn't have a buy-in, um, he would have no reason to, to support that. So we on a pretty regular basis um, build goals together or commitments together on what we're gonna do in order to be able to think, achieve the things we wanna achieve. And then it's easy for me to say, hey, I'm working right now, now is when I need to stay focused and um, you get to go do, and then we actually have other things that he has planned while I'm working so that we can stay focused on that. Yeah. It, it seems, it seems like you do a really good job of expectation setting too, or being really clear on what's expected or what, you know, what the goals are. I mean, I'm picking up on, uh, does that sound accurate? Uh, Dave, it's a necessity. <laughs> yeah. If I, uh, he's a social a uh, little human, and if I don't have that set up, then I would never get anything accomplished. So a social little human. <laughs> he's a he's a social little human. COVID has been pretty tough on him, so he's pretty excited about school and mm. spending time with other people other than just mom. So it's good. Yeah. 
Great. Well, I mean, we can continue this for a while, but we'll probably cut it off here. Um, thank you, Laura, for You're being welcome. my uh, guinea pig in this. Um, and so Laura and I probably could have continued that conversation for a while. We were talking about pretty broad things, um, nothing very, uh, very narrow. But my goal in that conversation was to continue drawing her out, getting her continuing to talk through um, um, through my mirroring and also to call out positive things that I'm noticing when she's saying something about uh, what she likes to do with her son. I'm labeling that and saying, Laura, it sounds like you really care about the upbringing of your son or, you know, whatever my thing might be. And I promise you, as you go, I mean, your spouse is going to hate you. We joke about it on the team a lot now. And then Hannah, my wife, anytime I practice this now, I mean, she can, she picks up on it eventually. We laugh about it. But I promise you, if you go into conversations where people are not prepared for you to be practicing your mirroring and labeling on them, they will feel like you are the most engaged, understanding, curious, inquisitive person they've ever talked to. Um, just go practice it. Again, it's like the thumb finger thing. It's going to feel really weird at first. I, I was at a conference a couple of days ago in Phoenix and for one of the meals, I was just eating by myself at this restaurant that I like down in Scottsdale and they have these incredible barbacoa tacos. But I'll typically just go sit at the bar and, and just hang out and talk to the talk to whoever's around but the uh, the bartender was visibly upset this day a couple last week and one of the other servers came over and they were talking five feet from me and she's like what's wrong and he said eh, it's just personal stuff and so I mean he was acknowledging that like something is you know and so it sort of became my mission for the next hour however long I was sitting there eating to see if I could break this guy down a little bit through mirroring and labeling and so there was a couple different conversations here and there and at some point um, th after a few of the questions, he just really started opening up and it came out that he had a daughter. And so I asked about his daughter and, and then he went into this whole dramatic situation with his ex-wife and how his parents are still close with her. And when they come to town, they hang out with the ex-wife when they hang out with him. And I mean, it like me and this guy were best friends within about a half hour. And, uh, it was a slow night at this restaurant. And, um, I, I feel bad almost practicing these tactics with this guy, but I, my goal was to let him feel heard and understood. And like, I cared and I did, I did care, but my labeling and my mirroring uh, was my skill. So something to, uh, something to practice. So that's number two. Number three, let's move on to the next slide is the accusations audit. And um, the goal of the accusations audit is to essentially call out what we think they are already thinking. Um, and so in our industry, most of you are in the real estate space, uh, some of you are not, but most of you, that's your context. So that's what we're going to mostly talk about in our industry. We can usually identify a lot of times what we think the other side is already thinking, right? I mean, what you go to a for sale by owner seller's house, we could probably all jot down the top three things that we think that they're probably thinking about us. And, and so in an accusations audit, remember the negative emotions from the amygdala when we're calling out ahead of time, what we think somebody might be thinking, um, it's going to downplay it. And if anything, they're going to, even if they are thinking the extremes, they're going to back it up. They're going to bring it back a little bit at that point. So if I go into a conversation with a for sale by owner or seller, and I say, listen, I know that you probably think that I only care about the commission and that I'm really not even going to do that much work to get your home sold. And that I'm probably not worth the money. Uh, I realize that that's probably where we're starting, right? And so by even just calling that out, um, I've heard the example a lot of going down to a hotel front desk, wanting to ask for an upgrade or wanting to ask for a, um, for a late checkout or whatever. And we're, we're prefacing our request with, I'm sorry, I apologize ahead of time. I mean, I am probably, I, I hope I don't ruin your day with this request. I know you probably think I'm just trying to get something free or get something out of you. Um, we're prefacing what we're about to say with uh, um, something that's setting them up that uh, is probably going to sound a lot worse. I did this yesterday with an offer that I presented. Like, listen, I get that this offer is going to seem really low. You're probably going to think that we're just trying to steal this house and that we don't even really care about it. We just want to get a deal. And, and I completely get it. I mean, I am over exaggerating what I think they're going to think as an, as an accusations audit on myself to pave the way for it. I, you're not going to like this. I've got bad news. This is going to make you really mad. I apologize ahead of time because I'm probably about to ruin your day. Um, as an example, you're listing pricing, you're, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. I mean, I talked to a seller about their house. They show me all these things. They say, and this is the best house in the neighborhood because 
it was built on a Tuesday and the other ones were built on Fridays, which historically is not a good thing or whatever the thing might be. And honestly, we, we sit down and I say, I understand that. Um, I hear that you're looking for um, such and such a price. You're not going to like what I'm about to say. Honestly, you're probably going to think that all I want to do is secure the listing at the lowest possible price to make my job easier. Frankly, though, I'm, I'm so committed to making sure you accomplish your goals that we need to be really strategic with how we price this home. And I'm just not seeing $650,000 listing in, in these comps. The market seems to be expecting a little more like a $600,000 price. And I'm paving the way for the bad news I'm delivering to them, which in this case is that their house is not worth what they think their house is worth um, by laying out the accusations that uh, they might be thinking. So you might think, I know you might think that I'm just wanting to get this house listed at the lowest possible price, yada, yada, yada. Whatever the thing is that they might be thinking. But believe me when I tell you that my commitment is to your goal and that I want to make sure that you accomplish exactly what you're trying to accomplish. And to do that, I really think that we need to take this strategy, not that strategy. Um, that is the accusations audit. There's lots of times that uh, this applies to way different than uh, um, way different than real estate. But um, any scenario we talk about, I'm sure we could come up with a great accusations audit for what that other side is going to say. Um, you're at a car dealership and you're trying to get the best deal you can on a price of a car. Um, you could call out whatever you think that person's probably thinking, that salesperson or that manager or whatever it is. So um, that's probably as deep as we'll go on accusations, audits, any questions or any of this on any of these things, feel free to type them into the chat and we'll pause every once in a while to uh, jump in and add them. I think let me know if there's questions piling up here um, once we get through these. So let's go through number four, the skill number four is the power of no. Um, the, obviously that slide did not get finished. The power of no. Um, just think as an example, I mean, we've probably all had the person, the survey taker when you're walking into um, King Supers or grocery store and they say, hey, do you got a minute? And they've got their thing, their clipboard already. And your, <laughs> your gut reaction, your, your visceral reaction is probably, no, absolutely not. Um, but I mean, if you are, if you do have a minute or if you're interested, you are probably going to give one of three kinds of yeses. There's three different ways to say yes. The first one is the counterfeit yes. And that is the yes I give if I feel like I've been trapped or I want to know how soon will this be over? Or maybe you want to know more, but they don't quite trust you. And so you'll give like a yeah or sure, you know, some kind of long drawn out like yeah, I have, I have a minute, but is it really a minute? Are we actually talking a minute? Is this like a timeshare presentation where they say, do you have 30 minutes to learn about the resort? And then four hours later, you're just trying to get your stupid gift card so you can get to your next thing. I mean, what kind of, like, what am I actually saying yes to? That's a counterfeit yes. A confirmation yes might be pretty succinct, but like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. I got a couple minutes, sure. And then a commitment yes is fairly concise, but more certain, absolutely. Most of you probably aren't saying that to the survey taker outside King Supers, but do you have a minute? And you say, absolutely, I have a minute. Um, but anytime we are asked to say yes to something, typically in the back of our head, we're a little cautious about what we're saying yes to do, what we're saying yes to. Um, if I say yes, how long are we talking? What's it gonna cost? How quickly can I end this? Um, when we say no, it feels very safe. We feel protected. You know, dad, can I? No, absolutely not okay, wait, what did you want to do? You know, I mean, you say, it's easy to say no. I mean, we're all like, especially if you're a parent, I mean, you're pretty well trained at saying no. And the premise of this skill is helping clients accomplish their goal and get to where we're taking them by allowing them to say no instead of yes. Uh, people are automatically hesitant to say yes. And we need to shift that offer to a no and recreate our questions so that their answer is no. And that is agreement. So uh, let's talk about what that means. Instead of me saying um, do you agree? So I would say, I think we'll, we'll just stick with the same example of the $600,000 pricing. Um, so instead of me saying, here's the comps, here's the situation, I think we should list it at $600,000. Do you agree? And the client would say, I don't know about that. As opposed to, here's the comps, here's our situation. I think our best strategy would be to list the property at $600,000. Do you disagree? You know, the question is the same. I'm asking them if we can move forward with this plan, but asking them to say no as opposed to asking them to say yes, scientifically is much easier for them. Um, instead of saying, can you go along with this? I'm asking, does this sound like something you wouldn't be able to get behind? Um, instead of, are you ready to move forward? I'm asking, 
uh, are you against moving forward? You know, if this is the plan, are you ready to go? Should we move forward? As opposed to, here's the plan, here's what we should do. Are you against moving forward with this plan? Um, some of it's voice inflection as well. It's easier to make a voice inflection towards a no than it is to make the, the proper downswing voice inflection towards a yes. But um, one of my favorites that uh, some other people pull off well that I don't pull off quite as well would be, would it be ridiculous? So um, does this, this, this idea sound ridiculous? Uh, would it be ridiculous for us to just sit down for 20 minutes to talk about this in person? I mean, think about that when you're talking to a potential lead on the phone and they're asking about a house and you're talking about some other stuff coming up and things like that. Um, hey, would it be ridiculous for us to just sit down for 20 minutes and talk about this in person? Or you could rephrase that lots of ways, but would you be offended if we just, if I just asked you to sit down for a few minutes to talk about this? Would, would, would that be a bad idea? Would that be a waste of time? Do you think it would be a giant waste of your time for us to just continue this conversation in person? I mean, something that's allowing them to be like, no, no, I don't think that's, no, that wouldn't be a waste of my time. No, that's not offensive. No, that's not ridiculous. Um, you get the point. Would you be offended if, are you against, have you given up on what can be a good way to re-engage a lead later on in the process? So um, you haven't gotten a hold of somebody a couple of times, you send them a quick text or email or whatever that said, hey, have you given up on us working together? Just wanted to see. Um, it's easier for them to say, no, 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 sorry. I haven't, I haven't given up on it. Things are just busy, yada, yada, yada. As opposed to, do you still work with me? Can we still work together? I mean, getting that yes is gonna be very difficult, but allowing them to agree with you by saying no is gonna get you much further. So. Um, does that sound like something you can't get behind? That would be a no. Okay, that's number four. Let's go on to number five, which is the fear of loss. Huh. Like I said, I wrote this class just for today for all of our conversation. And clearly this one did not get into the uh, slide remake. So you don't get any uh, little uh, notes on this one, but number five is the fear of loss. And so um, our goal with the fear of loss is to paint the picture of the world without your value proposition or without your desired outcome or whatever you're offering or whatever. And we essentially say, let's pretend we go to this place that you're suggesting as opposed to the place I'm suggesting. So let's pretend we go with your price instead of my price. So Mr. Seller, let's just pretend we list the house at 650 instead of 600, like I'm suggesting. Um, Theoretically, I mean, and we're seeing this a lot, two weeks go in and we've had some showings, but no offers yet. Uh, at this point, we're probably talking about a price reduction because two weeks is pretty stigmatizing in this market. So then we go down to uh, 639.9 at that point, let's say. And then another week goes by, we get a second showing and eventually we, uh, you know, buyers are seeing the blood in the water and, and they start making offers down around 600 at that point because uh, they can tell that they don't have to pay anywhere near asking price by then. So let's pretend we go with that route as opposed to this route where you uh, follow the guidance that I'm suggesting. We listed to $600,000. We create a lot of hype and interest and we get a lot of offers the first weekend. The price moves up and the offer we choose is $630,000, but they're waiving inspection, appraisal, loan contingency. They're closing in two weeks, probably cash. I mean, whatever. You're, you're painting the picture of the two scenarios or options usually prefaced with a let's pretend or let's let's just go down this path that you're suggesting and see the potential uh, uh, the potential outcome or you can apply it to somebody hiring you let's pretend you don't hire me let's pretend you hire another agent that's super busy and they they have no time to market your property they have no marketing staff on their team or able to spend tab dollar or whatever um, the ultimate result is that the house sells for x percent less yada 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 um, with a buyer I think uh, is a great way to use this um, uh, this skill right now, the fear of loss, because you're painting the picture of what could happen in the future in the market if they choose not to uh, to work with you. Let's pretend you don't hire me. You hire a different agent who doesn't list as much property or they they you look at 50 houses, you write offers on eight of them that don't get accepted and you can create your own, obviously. I mean, if you're um, an agent that doesn't list as much property, but you have a lot of time, that would be your value proposition is that you're available. You're ready to jump in and help whenever they need. Uh, as opposed to that busy agent that never has time to get you in that house and they, you know, you miss the house or whatever. But anyways, um, seven years from now, when it's time to sell, the house is worth the same that you paid today because you overpaid for it today. And even worse, your dream house became available, but it was listed by me and then you didn't have a chance at it because it actually ended up selling off market. You know, whatever, I'm painting this picture of like, let's pretend you go the other route. Let's pretend you go your route and not, uh, um, 
and not my route. And then eventually we're looking to uh, looking for the close. I mean, that's a lot of money. I mean, honestly, the amount of money on the table here of going that route instead of this route is a lot of money. Um, so can I ask your permission that we move forward with this option? Yeah, lots of times for the close, we do at some point uh, need a yes. And then we could switch that too. Can I ask you, would it be ridiculous if I asked your permission to move forward with this option that we're looking for a no to close it? So um, there you go. Let's pause from skills. We're going to talk about five everyday opportunities to use these skills now. So we're going to go through different scenarios of things that come up in our industry and then some of the different um, things that we've talked about that are going to apply and helping us negotiate through them. Um, before we jump into the last section, Ingrid, any pertinent questions that we should pause on? Nope, you're good. Okay, let's keep going. So through this last section, if anybody wants to drop anything in there, feel free. Or like I said, there will be a couple opportunities to continue the conversation afterwards. So um, five everyday uh, places to apply the stuff that we've talked about. Let's go forward in the slides. Number one, uh, price reduction. I think this is probably one of the best um, applications of some of the stuff we've talked about. Um, so let's talk about, you know, we, we've mentioned, I mentioned there's 900 price reductions a week, over 900 price reductions a week right now. So obviously this is a skill that we could all use in this conversation as the market starts to do wonky things. And we priced based on what happened in March and April and not based on what happened in August or the seller wants to price based on March and April. Um, and so a couple of things we're applying here. I mean, the first is going to be an accusations audit when I'm calling the seller and saying, you're not going to like this. I mean, and there's another study I was reading about this morning, even that talked about anytime you preface bad news with something good as like a lead in, it always makes the bad news worse. And so if I call my seller, and I say, how's it going? How's your day? How are the kids? Okay. Hey, let's talk about the price of your house. It is almost always going to make the, the painful bad news is going to feel more painful than if I just come right out and say, Hey, I've got some bad news. You're not going to like this. You're going to think that my only goal is to get you to drop your price to make my job easier. Um, the two houses that sold in your neighborhood, one for $15 a foot less than yours is listed for, and one for $25 a foot less than yours is listed for. They're really giving us a hard time. I mean, that's just the fact. I mean, I'm coming into this conversation with the information, whoever has the most information wins. And I'm bringing them to this realization that the two homes that sold recently, um, they're just not where we are. And so my calibrated questions though, at that point, so how do you think um, we should respond? Uh, how and what are differentiated? They're not confrontational questions, you know, how or what, like, wh what, do you, what, are your what are your thoughts on that? How does that, uh, as I said, I'm not saying, why do you think they're sold and ours didn't? You know, how and what questions are very um, um, deferential. But what is it about your house that causes you to think buyers are going to pay more for it? I mean, what are the what are some things here that you're seeing on yours that you think they didn't see? Or uh, what do you suppose caused the buyers to purchase that one and, and not yours? I mean, obviously it's price, but um, through the accusations audit, through the calibrated questions, we're drawing them back to the point um, with the information that we need. We're drawing them back to the point where we say, here's all the information. We need to talk about a plan here. So um, I'm telling you, the accusations audit probably in every conversation will pave the way, especially when it's with bad news. Uh, number two, let's talk about securing a listing or buyer client. This is probably the, we could spend the most time talking about this one, but um, anytime we're securing a client, the, it's incredibly important to have the information. So knowing the neighborhood better than the seller, uh, knowing every comp. I mean, I talked about the, uh, the, I think one of the best calibrated questions we can use in a listing appointment when we're going through comparable sales is have you been in this house? You know, I mean, this is your neighbor, six doors down. They sold last week for this much. Have you ever been in this house? I mean, it's going to give them the opportunity to share probably everything that you need to uh, be ready to overcome that you don't, everything else is you can prepare for. You can't prepare for what they're about to tell you about what happened in that house or why the person sold or what the neighborhood's saying about that, uh, um, about that. But in this discovery conversation with a seller um, securing this listing, we are using our mirroring, we're using our labeling, and we're truly getting to know them. We're trying to learn everything we can about their situation, about their wants and needs, and why they're selling, and where they're going, and all these things. We're using our magic wand question. Um, everyone's priorities in the sale are different, and for some, it's all about price. For others, it's about the right terms, or uh, others want to be really specific about who buys their house, uh, fair housing lawsuit. Or if I had a magic wand, and I could wave and make everything the perfect situation happen, 
uh, what would that look like for you? And so some of these calibrated questions that I'm using with a seller are designed to just get them talking, getting them opening up about what, uh, what they're looking for. Um, so, I mean, I'm going through my comparable sales, I'm putting them in front of them and saying, based on uh, what you're seeing there in your hand, what price do you think the home is actually gonna sell for? Uh, not what price do you want, but what price do you actually think it's gonna sell for? Um, and of course, they're gonna put out their, uh, their desire, you know, this is what I'd like to get for it. And it's another opportunity for a caliber or for uh, accusations on it. Ugh, yeah, totally get it. You're gonna hate me. Uh, you're gonna think that I only wanna secure the house at the lowest possible price to make my job easier. I'm just not seeing 1.2 million here. I'm seeing, I don't know, a buyer pain threshold, maybe around 1.1 million. Am I seeing that wrong? I mean, I'm asking and giving them the opportunity for no. I mean, is there, uh, is, you know, do you see that? You know, do you agree? You know, yes, all these yes questions are a great way for them to be like, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm, you know, I'm here. I mean, I'm getting them to agree by drawing them to, you know, am I seeing this wrong? I mean, am I crazy? Or is this, is that what you're, you know, whatever. Um, and then the fear of loss. And so let's pretend we go with your price. You know, let's pretend we do list at, you know, this price. And then I'm painting this picture through the fear of loss um, of, uh, of that. So uh, last thing on securing client is whoever has the most options wins. So my job is to uncover off market, uh, uh, off market properties. And I can do that in so many ways, but um, upcoming off market groups, several of you are in uh, a couple of the off market groups that we run east side, west side, I think there's one for the north side of town too. Um, through groups like this, we're seeing upcoming stuff, open houses, circle dialing, door knocking, just sold signs in the yard. I mean, there's so many things that we can do to create options for our buyers that helps them win. And so uh, reminding ourselves that that is our fiduciary responsibility is to create options. So um, let's go to number three, securing a hey, contract. Hey, yes. I'm going to interrupt you. I just had a good question and it's appropriate for this point. I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, but can you share an example for when someone wants to hire a friend or family over you? Um, an example of somebody wanting, wants to hire a friend or family over you. Yeah. When and, you're trying to secure that buyer agency agreement. And so are you just looking for like objection handlers for how to overcome not, that objection? Not sure. It came in in the chat, but yeah, for sure. I mean, so I, mean, I think that's a great opportunity to through the mirroring and through the labeling to really draw them out on what their thought is or what their hope is. Um, and then I would ask them just to calibrate a question of and lots of times the claim is, I mean, I should probably list with this person because they're family and how can I not list with the uh, list of family. And so one of the labels I might put on that is it seems like you really care about your family and keeping a strong, healthy relationship. Uh, Ingrid, if you're up for it, I mean, just, let's just have the conversation. So Ingrid, you just told me that. And I say, man, Ingrid, I really appreciate you saying that. I mean, it sounds like you really care about the relationship with your family and you, you don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. Is that, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I, I totally get that. You know, Andrew, what I normally see, I mean, I obviously, um, I don't know this, this family member, this person. I mean, so I, I really couldn't tell you if they're a great agent or maybe if they're um, a little bit lacking in skills. I have no idea. But I can tell you, Ingrid, that over the, all the transactions that I've touched and that I see, it seems like relationships are strained more when somebody does work with an agent that's maybe not the best fit for them. It can really kill relationships as opposed to having a conversation with that agent saying, I love you. I respect you. I want a great relationship with you. I just feel like in this case, it'd be best for a relationship if I go with uh, the best person for the job and not just the most convenient person for the job. Um, then I realized that wasn't really role-playing. That was sort of just me dragging one question out of you. But I mean, typically I would um, love for them to recognize that if their goal is strong relationship, their best bet is going to be to leave that person completely out of this. Um, however, if they don't go for that, I mean, I'd be more than happy if this oftentimes it's a newer agent when they, uh, when they want to bring somebody in, at least in my experience, it's usually been somebody that's maybe newer to the industry. If their family member sells a hundred houses a year and is the number one agent in town, they're not going to be talking to you in the first place. They probably have already hired that agent. I mean, usually it's like they're unsure a little bit if they're even in the conversation. And so I would offer to bring that person in and say, I'd be more than happy to partner with this person in this transaction. And that way they could still get paid on it. They can see our team's process and how we go about things. And that way they could sort of see um, um, some of the other things they could add in their business. Uh, and in the end, I mean, it uh, probably could be beneficial for both. Um, and if they won't even go for that, then you could offer a referral to them. I mean, I, 
I would gladly take it off their plate and we'll do everything and then we'll just pay them a referral. So they still get paid, but then you still get the best representation you can get. And there's a lot of different ways to go about that conversation, but I definitely think um, the first step has to be that curiosity of fully understanding the situation about uh, who they are, what their wants and needs are, what their desires are, things like that. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, let's talk about securing a contract for a buyer. I mean, so th this one of the rules that's gonna apply in this primarily is that whoever has the most options wins. And like we've talked about a couple of times, it's on us to find options for our buyers um, off market, through relationships, through our own listings, through our brokerage. It's your job to get options. And so uh, I, we talked a little bit about this, but I mean, when we're constantly seeing the same people over and over again, and doing deals with the same people over and over again, how you reacted and how you responded and how pleasant you were to work with in your last transaction probably is going to determine whether or not you uh, are finding off market or finding upcoming deals for your buyer anyways. So I think a lot of times clients sort of miss out on that fact that the, your agent's reputation in town and whether or not people like working with them or not will determine whether or not you get your house in a lot of cases. But um, that's a much deeper rabbit hole for us to go down right now. Um, I had a deal a couple, weeks, or a couple months ago where we had lots of offers and the, there was two that really stood out. There was two that were just better than, uh, better than the rest. And so we put them both in front of the seller and said, terms are the same, price is the same. I mean, they've both really maxed out their price at this point. Um, the only thing I can tell you that's different is that I've worked with this agent before and they were great and I really enjoyed working with them and I've never heard of this person. So take that at face value. I mean, you can, uh, you can let that sway you if you want or not, but uh, more often than not, the seller's gonna go with the person that's, uh, person that you know but um i think it's important to keep in mind too and this is this can be applied both to the um to the buy side or the sell side but in, in this industry i mean a lot of this stuff does come back around and it is our responsibility to uh to be treating every agent and every contract we touch with the type of respect and candor and care as though we're going to see them tomorrow or see them at the next deal this uh we were an offer for a buyer yesterday two days ago and it's it's a house that, that'll sit for a little bit. It needs some work. It's in the multi-million dollar price range. So it's not like flying off the shelf. But in the conversation with the agent, they didn't like how low of an offer my agent wrote. And so I, of course, had an accusations audit for him. And I um, my biggest goal was that we had a strong conversation and that we're, we're friends at the end of this. And so I told him, and I totally get it. I mean, I understand that you guys need to wait and see what's around. I mean, let me know if there's anything I can do to help and we'll keep an eye on it. We'll keep you posted. I mean, I'm not fighting with this guy and trying to get him to see he's wrong and all these things, because this is an ongoing conversation. You know, my negotiation with him is going to be probably a month long, two months long, three months long. Um, so we got to keep that in mind too, that a lot of these relationships, especially in this industry are very much built on trust and respect for each other. And that is our negotiation. I mean, it's an ongoing negotiation built on that trust. So um, before we go too much more on that, let's jump to the next one, inspection objection or inspection resolution. Probably um, most of what we do that feels like negotiation, especially in this market where it's just write your offer, throw it out there and hope it gets accepted. I mean, we feel like we're negotiating more with inspection, typically, if there is an inspection, um, because we're actually going back and forth. You know, we're suggesting this, they're suggesting that. It feels like more of a dance than uh, some of the other stuff right now in this industry until things uh, level back out. Um, so a couple of things to keep in mind for it with inspection objection and inspection resolution. Uh, one of the strategy or one of the rules we talked about was never go first. I mean, reiterating the story from earlier about um, the inspection items that led to the concession between 8,000 and 10,000 and we ended up at 1,500. It's just really important to keep in mind with this stuff that uh, whenever possible, still maintaining respect and deference for the other side that we are um, letting them go first when at all possible. But, um, and then too, I just think it's incredibly important for buyers to be really strategic about what they're asking for in this market. So uh, I always tell buyers five to seven items tops, but I'm nailing down the buyer to which items are complete deal breakers. And if there are only three deal breaker items and five non deal breaker items that I need to be very careful about putting them in there because it's going to give the seller the ability to grab a couple things they don't care about. And so if I can coach my buyer through the strategy of requesting only the most, most, most important things, then st statistically, we're going to get more or higher dollar items done than, uh, uh, than if we ask for lots of things. So and I might reference those concerns as being overlooked. Like, here's the things that are concerns to them that we're not actually going to ask for. And then here's the three things that are just like to them, they're, you know, 
beyond health and safety. You know, they got kids sleeping in here or whatever. Um, and then lastly, on inspection negotiation, whoever has the most options wins. Um, and we could go deep on this. This is probably a whole nother conversation about listing mastery, but it's so incredibly important, especially right now in this industry, that we are getting every possible option for our seller that we can so that they have strength to add inspection. Uh, this is on the seller side for sure, but um, I see it a lot right now where con you know, a house will be listed on Thursday and then you have a scheduling showing, scheduled showing for Saturday morning and Friday afternoon, they took the offer. You know, and so they won't see the entire weekend. They won't see all the other contracts, the other offers. They won't, 90% of the showings won't even happen, et cetera. Um, and it's really important for the seller to know that when you do that, you're removing all other options and you're taking all of your negotiating power away by not collecting the other 10 offers that are coming in. And in this market, I mean, if a seller lists at 600 and they get a 680 offer, they're probably thinking this is as good as it gets. This is crazy. It cannot go any higher than 680. Little do they know, there's probably cash from California ready to pay 800 for that house and they'll never see it because they uh, probably took bad advice. Now, the flip side of that coin, and I know half of you are probably thinking this, is that sometimes that fear of missing out will cause people to do crazy things. And so when somebody brings an offer to me, let's take the 680 example and just run it out. When we list this house at 600 and a buyer brings an offer at 680 on Friday, for me to go back to the seller and say, hey, I don't think you should take this. I think you should probably see the weekend, but let's throw something out in front of them that is just crazy. It says, you know, if you, uh, if you want to take this house in the market before the weekend, it's going to have to be whatever, that much higher, 725 or whatever, and putting something out there in front of them that probably is higher than what we're going to see. But if they really, really want, I mean, we can use this against them as well up front so that, um, uh, so that they know when they're in first position, it's with the options, the backup, and uh, uh, stepping into first position as opposed to uh, um, as opposed to without. So I think it's important for buyers to, or for sellers to know that there is strategy on both sides. There's strategy to really milking that weekend and getting every offer they possibly can. And there's also an ability to uh, to use that offer uh, um, offer against them. So um, we're seeing a lot of termination right now. And so when contracts are dying after two weeks from inspection, you know, if we didn't take all the offers we possibly could have. Um, then we're really missing out. And I think this is an important thing with inspection as well. This is the last thing I'll say on inspection then we'll move forward. The, the value of obtaining all the information I can in this negotiation is incredibly important. And so um, when I'm the listing agent and I get an inspection report and a request of lots of things, it's really important then for me to go shop that to my backup offers before I respond. And so they come and say, we had all these things, we want a $25,000 reduction or we're walking away. And let's say there's 10 other offers, but two that were uh, good offers. It's important for me to go to those other two offers now and say, here's where we're at. They have submitted their inspection report. Here's the report. Here's their objection. And it looks like this thing's going to die. Where's your buyer at? Are they willing to jump in at this price and without asking for anything, look this over, let me know so that I can take this information now and go back to the first contract and say, I completely understand. If you guys need to walk, you need to walk. I don't blame you. Do what you got to do. But just so you know, the next buyer is ready to jump in at this price as is with the inspection concerns, et cetera. Without that information, I have no idea what I'm negotiating with. But if I take the time and put in the effort to go get that information and then bring it back to the current contract and say, here's where we're at. Here's why we're here. Um, you do what you got to do, but we, we do have to stick with this price because of this, this, and this. Um, I don't have that ability though. If I didn't approach the contract negotiation piece originally strategically by uh, using it to create as many offers as possible. So I think that scenario that we just packaged there is probably the best example we can come up with of how there are so many different negotiations throughout the contract. They all kind of bundle and work together um, whether we realize it or not. And so every step we take throughout this process from meeting the seller to the creating a the, the price conversation to the marketing plan to everything leads to the number of offers which leads to the strength and inspection which leads to whether or not we have to worry about appraisal i mean it all works together and everything we do somehow uh, um, is a negotiation so um so that's our fifth uh, that we talked about resolving inspection um that's the end of the negotiation conversation for now i'd love to continue it if anybody um, wants to, there are a couple other opportunities to jump in. Let me go to, let's see, open house class. Uh, lots of you have probably taken it before. I teach it about once a quarter. Um, I think the process that we've created for open houses is, is, uh, is pretty solid. And so it's a one hour class. We just run through that. Uh, I lead a monthly breakfast mastermind where 
top agents around talk about what's working in their business and what's not and where they could use help and things like that. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, let somebody be a fly on the wall or join us if you'd like. Um, Listing mastery class is coming up in person and on Zoom. I think it's next month. All of these, you can just shoot me an email. I'll let you know when they're coming. Um, The legend, Ashley Gillespie, who's the um, KWYP Young Professionals um, president in Colorado, is teaching her social media class coming up, which is awesome, how to crush social media and real estate. All of those are going to be great. Shoot me an email. I don't have any info on any of this, which is probably not very helpful. Um, so I apologize, but all of them will be good. Shoot me an email, Dave at offerscript.com. And thanks for being here. I hope there were some things in there negotiation wise that were helpful. And if there were any other questions that popped out or if anybody has any questions, I think we have a few minutes now, feel free to jump in. Um, um, just one, you were going to, if we had a question or anyone who wants to stick around, talk about when, why is helpful. Give a few minutes oh, yeah. of that. And then just so everyone knows, um, we will send out the um, recording of this in case you know somebody who could benefit from it. For sure. Um, I'm going to have to regain my train of thought with the why piece. Um, it was something along the lines of, um, okay, yeah, I remember where I was going with it. So lots of times, you know, anytime, sometimes my context is in the brokerage world of like, you know, the different value propositions that different brokerages offer. And so um, there's lots of different options, lots of different compensation models, et cetera. But sometimes the question about why, you know, why somebody's here, why somebody's having this conversation can be a great way to identify what is actually valuable to them. And so with any listing presentation I'm in, I could go off on all the things that we could do that they would find value in. You know, we're going to market it here. We're going to do this and that and all these things. And at the end of the day, if that seller doesn't really care about those marketing things, if all they really care about is that their house is getting foreclosed on in two weeks and they need it sold today, right now, then it really doesn't matter. Um, And so the importance of why in some of these contexts is that I can actually drive to what their motivation is through why and get to what really matters to them. So Ingrid, I I mean, I really appreciate you having me out here today. I just got to ask you though, I mean, there's lots of options for who you could hire. I mean, so-and-so is the neighborhood expert. There's this company that you see all their stuff. There's this, there's this. I just got to ask you, what, why, did, why me? I mean, like, why did you call me? Why are, you know, why did you bring us out here? Somehow asking this question of what is it, what perceived value do you see that, that you called me out here? And so they might say, well, I, I see your ads on Facebook all the time. And I think that's where buyers are finding houses right now or whatever, or you sold so-and-so's house down the street really quickly. And I've really got to get this sold, you know, right away. Um, to me, that's one of the best applications of the word why, because we can actually get somebody opening up about what is value to them. And it's one of the most arrogant things we can do is to approach a situation as though we understand what value is to them without asking, without knowing, because value to one person is not value to another. And so why me? I mean, gosh, I'm grateful. I'm thankful that you let me out here, but like, why? <laughs> why did you do that? Um, can really uh, can really draw them out. So um any other thoughts, questions? Is that something? That was it in the chat. Okay, sounds good. Well, if anybody wants to continue the conversation, I eat breakfast and lunch every day. And so I would be happy to grab coffee or eat lunch or breakfast with anybody who wants to continue the negotiation conversation or just any generic business building uh, conversation. So thank you all for being here and we will wrap.